mention the word abundant life, it's Jesus trying to describe something that there was no word for in the human language. It is the life of God. Hallelujah. Now, I, I want you to understand something. And uh, if you'll simply begin to do this, everything about your life will change. I know that many people have learned to pray and um, cry out to God about all the problems and all the bad situations and all the uh, unreasonable circumstances. But if you'll just forget about all that and start doing what you're supposed to be doing and begin to start thanking God. I, I love the song David is singing, Forget Not All of His Benefits. Hallelujah. And you just start thanking Him. You just thank Him. You don't, you're not allowed to complain. You, you, you're not allowed to present or bring uh, the problem to the Lord. You just lift your hands towards heaven. This is the way you live your life. You just begin to thank God for all the good things that He's done for you. Um, I, I'm just, I have discovered that in any place, at any time, I can come under the glory and um, influence of the Holy Spirit, both on the outside where I can tangibly feel His presence, and also on the inside where emo the emotions of God, which are the joy of the Lord, the, the emotions of God, which is His overwhelming love and compassion. Compassion is one of the deepest emotions that I know. Where all these good things of life overwhelm me. And that's never happened in my life or in anybody in the, uh, in the context of the Bible's life while they were making known their complaint unto the Lord. While they were discussing all the things that they wish they had and why don't they have and why hasn't it worked out and I feel like a miserable wretch and all of this other stuff that people do, oh God. I mean, it's good to say, Lord, forgive me, have mercy upon me if you trespassed against them. But you need to quickly receive that mercy and that forgiveness and go right on in to praise in him. Because it's there that you're going to hook up with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> right now, in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, well, what is he doing? I'm by bypassing your intellect. I'm bypassing everything that you're understanding. I'm going to the heart of the matter. I'm going right to your spirit. I'm talking right into your spirit. I'm speaking right into the realms of those things that need to be adjusted in your life. Hallelujah. I, I'm speaking into that place where you can be strengthened by the Spirit in your inner being. And when you, when you strengthen by the Spirit and in, your, in your inner being, the things that you couldn't do before, now you're able to do. The things that in the natural was impossible for you to accomplish, now it's easy for you to do. Because supernatural strength is upon you. When Samson... Oh, was when Samson was strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord. And, and of course, Scripture uses those words. He walk away with the gates of the city. When strengthened by the Spirit of the Lord, he can take a jawbone of a donkey and kill, you know, a whole army of troops that had come to try to destroy him, destroy the people, and, and dominate the people of God. Oh, tonight, I wish, I, I wish that um, you just participate. I wish that you participate. One of the ways that we get people, no texting. On the front row. You have to pay attention to me. You have to hook up with me. Oh, the, one of the ways that we get you to participate is that we, get, we have you give of your finances, things that touch your heart. Money, money. I, I'm depending upon money. We want to touch your heart. If we can get to you, and, and some people get all upset about the money. You should get upset about the money. I mean, the Lord gave it to you and he can take it away. Okay. But if, you, if, he, if he gives it to you and he uses that as a means to take care of you, how many of you know the Lord wants to take care of you? He wants to take care of you. He does. How many of you know that he loves you? How many of you think that you're worth more than a bird? Okay? And, and, and it's far more. He's not going to give you bird feed. Okay? He's going to take good care of you. How many of you think of you, that God values you more than a flower? He does. A flower fades away and passes away. It's remembered no more. You, you lost forever. You, you're for, living forever. You have great value uh, to the Lord. And he, he's shown and, and demonstrated that value. When 
He sent His only begotten Son to die in our place, to take all of our sin, to take all of our pain, to take all of our ungodliness and all of our separation and all of our rebellion from off of us. Wow! I mean, my goodness. I mean, think about, think about this goodness of God. Think about our worth. Think about your worth to God that if Father spared not His Son but gave Him up as an offering for every one of us, how much more now should He freely give us all things by Christ Jesus? Hallelujah. Ah. Oh, just to think about your value. If I could just get you to think about your value. How much God values you. How much He loves you. If I could just get you over here into this place where you begin to know and believe the love of God. And, I can, and, and out of that, something begins to touch you in your heart. And you begin to participate and respond to God. And cooperate with God on the basis of something that touched you in your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not begrudgingly, not fearfully, not reluctantly, but out of worship. If you could, if, to, if tonight, if, if, if I started ministering by the Spirit concerning God's call upon your life and, and God's purpose for your life in terms of utilizing you to bless the nations of the earth and, and ministering to you the things of the Spirit and also financial means for you to be able to accomplish that, I know that your heart would be stirred because I know that your hearts are towards God and you're, you're responsive to the Lord. And then that you'd be stirred and you'd begin to give those things that are very important to you and they would actually bypass the calculations of what you think are important and they bypass the, the ideas and the concepts of your security and you would just give out of something that's far deeper than an intellectual understanding and re reasoning of things. You'd just give from your heart. You would give with abandonment. You wouldn't think about your mortgage. You wouldn't think about your food. You wouldn't think about your clothing. You wouldn't think about all the needs coming up because, you know, uh, December the 25th is right around the corner and you're budgeting for Christmas presents. You would just bypass all of that. We really want the same things to happen towards Christ Jesus in your life. <laughs> when it comes to thanksgiving, when it comes to praise, when it comes to worship. <laughs> if you, I'm telling you, if you'll stand and just worship Him, if you'll stand and give thanks, if you'll quit participating with all that Satan is trying to distract you with, and you'll just stand there and you'll worship Him and you'll praise Him and you give thanks, God will work miracles for you. The problems that were standing there in front of you, looming uh, over you, will all of a sudden, a sudden, sudden they'll be wiped out. They'll ultimately be destroyed by the, by the very power of God. And many of them, they'll just vanish because they were just deceptions anyways. They're just poof, because all they were were poofs anyways. They weren't even real. They were mountains to be moved. All they were were strongholds of the mind. They, were, they weren't a weapon formed against you that, was, that could really harm you or, or destroy you. They were imaginations. They weren't big things. They weren't big issues. If they're measured beyond, by the reality of that which would threaten your life, if they were measured by the, the reality of those things that are real tr trespasses against you, they're really nothing. They're very small things. And yet very small things. So many people have allowed those things to ruin or it not ruin in fact their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is infected, all you had the relationships are infected too. Sure. Hallelujah. When you've got wrong thinking in terms of your relationship with the Lord, you have wrong thinking in terms of your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with your neighbor, with your friend, with the people around you. Listen, God wants to bring us into a place of communion with Him where we can love our neighbor. And I'm telling you, loving your neighbor is the love that God has given to us and how, by, uh, for us to be able to deal with all of those that are around us in the world. To love thy neighbor is the uh, Samaritan who passes by the person who was obviously from the nation of Israel who was overwhelmed by robbers and left uh, stripped of his clothes and wounded. 
Jesus using that as a scenario to describe who is your neighbor. Your neighbor is anybody in the world you come in contact with. And God wants you to have the capacity to love them as you love yourself. And I'm telling you, when you begin to recognize the love of self-interest and your, all your disappointments are about, you didn't get what you wanted. You understand? You didn't get what you thought you wanted or what you thought you needed. Are you listening to me? And most of that stuff isn't real at all. It's not, it's, 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 it's not really even meaningful because it has not, it's only temporal. It has nothing to do with that which is eternal. It has nothing to do with your relationship with Jesus. It has nothing to do with making people around you happier, better. It has nothing to do with the expression of the love of God. But does just the opposite. It stops the expressions of the love of God. We want to teach you to walk in the Spirit. The Holy Ghost has come to teach us all things. He's come to lead us and guide us. Us. He wants to show us how to love our neighbor. He wants to, God's got a love for every situation. He wants to show us how to love our enemies and bless those who persecute us. Something that goes beyond the realms of just simple human ability because men are too immature. Even at the ancient, the age of 95, they're still too emotionally and spiritually immature to have such a capacity. To love when offended, love when transgressed against, to love when they don't understand, to love a different kind, a different culture, a different way, to relate to all people in such a way that only Christ Jesus could show us. A compassion for all men. My, He being moved with compassion. You know, I love this message of Christ Jesus. He, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. What an expression of divine love. He left all of his glory, all of his power, all of his riches, all of his fame to take upon this, the form of a servant to humble himself to a place of being despised and rejected, ridiculed, looked down on, not understood, completely misunderstood for the purpose of ransoming you and me. God has even a greater love that he wants us to be expressing for one another. To love one another in the community of the church even as he loved us. Hallelujah. My goodness, what a wonderful love. What a wonderful community. What a wonderful, what a wonderful and happy family. Hallelujah. Listen, I'm going to tell you, people, I wanted to say something. Wives, you must obey your husband. You must. Listen, you want to understand how you're supposed to obey your husband? Let me help you understand how you're supposed to obey your husband. Like Jesus obeyed the Father. Like a man is supposed to obey Jesus. Somebody said, well, I can't get along with my husband. He just pushes back. No. No, he's the leader. You're pushing back. You understand me? Yes. You're pushing back. That creates the problem and that creates strife. I want you to grab a hold of this with me. I want you to hear and I want you to understand there is a relationship that we can see modeled between the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ that we want to grab a hold of. Because that's a relationship that needs to be between us and the Father. I mean, us rather than the Lord Jesus. That's a relationship that needs to be between a wife and a husband. I'm going to tell you right now, there's more problems going on because in families because families simply don't understand the roles and responsibilities of the man and the woman. Let me just tell you this. If your husband's not walking with God, it don't even fit the context. Just forget about it. Huh? It's not even, it's completely out of context. No woman should follow a man who's following the devil. Okay? It's completely out of context. Are you listening to me? No man should follow, submit himself to, no woman should submit himself to a man who doesn't care about God and wants to lead the family into a place that is forever opposite of everything that God himself is. But when a man is walking with God, that's the context. Then as the father is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, and the man is ahead of the woman, and women, you have no right to ever push back. Amen. That's the way it is. Amen. Christ loved the church so much, he gave himself for the church. But when is the church ever going to say, well, Lord Jesus, I just disagree with you, and push back? No! Christ loved the church so much, he gave himself for the church, so the church can follow him. Hallelujah. And when I don't get what I want from Jesus, I don't give him the cold shoulder. Huh? And I'm not walking around disappointed. I'm going to tell you right now, women hold the key to happiness in a home. And when a wife isn't happy, happy wife, happy life is a true saying. 
And boy, does it go to another level when it comes to a spiritual realm because when that's violated in the spirit, a woman holds the key and the power to destroy her whole family. You listen to me, because it's true. It's true. And especially, that is especially true when it's a, it's a household of God. Praise God the church here tonight isn't pushing back on Jesus. Praise God tonight we're simply so honored and blessed and privileged that we get to follow Jesus. I'm telling you people, that is the servitude relationship, the love kind of relationship. There are too many women sitting around in the church influenced by feminine, feminism and humanism and having their way and having their rights and they don't even know anything about this love of God to love one another with the same love Love that Jesus loved us with in the context of divine order. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on now. This is very good. I got some. I got a few things I want to say. I just want to get some stuff straightened out here. Uh, I see some. I see some strongholds in a couple of people, and I know what the strongholds are from. I can fix you. I have been given the tools and an anointing and a power to fix you by the divine revelation of the Word of God. I'm not going to take you away from the Word of God. I'm not going to give you philosophical ideas. I'm not going to give you psychological ideas. I'm going to tell you what God says. I'm going to show you a very simple model that is expressed for us and exists between the Father and Christ Jesus so that you can understand it. I'm going to show you the model that exists between Jesus Christ and His church which speaks of the relationship between a husband and the wife. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And whatever you think the church ought to be doing and responding and behaving itself towards Jesus, that's the way the woman should be responding and behaving herself towards her husband. Amen. 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 Oh, there's so many people all over this world dying to hear this message. Families are falling apart right and left because there's so much satanic influence in the ideologies of men and is infecting their relationships with one another, both in the church and in the family. No, my, there is, we're going to have to be willing to cooperate with God. People, you know what? There is nothing more wonderful. There's nothing more of a glorious expression of heaven than being able to experience and know and cooperate and participate with the love of God. I know of nothing, no greater thing than being overwhelmed by His love. And if you want that, you have to participate with that love. You have to love, you're going to have to hug people. You're going to have to participate with love and kindness. And then all of a sudden, people in their homes, people in their close relationships, whether it's um, mom with dad or, or, or son with, with, uh, with the uh, father or son with the mother or whatever, especially family context it may be, they're not participating with love. They've allowed something to stand in the way. They can't move into a place with God. They're just shut off. They just feel dead inside. I, when people tell me I'm numb and dead, I know you got sin. And they say, they, well, I'm not committing adultery. No, you're committing hate. <laughs> oh, but it ain't my fault. Yeah, it is. It's always your fault. You're the one that's being most affected by it. It's your fault. Hallelujah. It ain't God's fault. And He's got the remedy for everybody's answer, for everybody's problem. He's got the solution for everybody's question. He's got the answer for everybody's question. And on that day, you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to give an account for yourself and no one else. You're going to give an account for your attitude. You're going to give an account for the way you follow Jesus. You're going to give an account for the way you participated with the Holy Ghost. You're not going to give an account for anyone else. Huh? You're not going to be able to stand before the Lord Jesus and say, I had such a bad life and a bad attitude and unable to cooperate and operate with you because my husband, because my wife, because my children, because my dad, because my mom, because my brother, because my sister, because my neighbor, because my enemy. Because Father gave us the solution. Amen. Hallelujah. He gave us, this, he gave us this wonderful love. In fact, the reality of it is this. When you are unwilling to walk in this kind of love, it invalidates every kind of gift. It doesn't matter if you speak with the tongues of men and of angels and you have not love. It profits you nothing. <laughs> it's, it's a sound of brass and tingling cymbals. It's an aggravating sound that don't feel like heaven, that don't sound like heaven. There's something grinding on me, something aggravating me about that sound. That's not the sound of heaven. 
There's a love problem. You may have a faith that can move mountains. If you have not love, it profits you nothing. It's been totally invalidated. Think about it. Jesus so connects the fruits of the Spirit with the gifts of the Spirit. In Mark chapter 11, when he says, a little bit of faith, with just a little bit of faith, nothing will be impossible with just a little bit of faith. Whatever you say, it will come to pass if you believe in your heart that you've received it. But when you stand praying and remember or account or deal or recognize that there's unforgiveness in your heart, Go and get it right. Go and make it right. Because the bottom line of it is, Papa's not going to be listening. In fact, when the Lord puts it into context, He says His face is against them that do wicked. He says his, his ears are open to the righteous, but His face is against them that do wickedness. And in that context, He's talking about strife. The tongue speaking evil. He's ta- he contrasts contrasted on the specific issue of whether or not you're pursuing peace, which is, a, which is a relationship of love with one another. He says, pursue peace and depart from evil. Pursue peace. Pursue that relationship that makes, that causes agreement and oneness of will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the kind of relationship Jesus had with Father. You know that? Oneness of will. I don't do my will, I do the Father's will. Somebody's got to be in charge. Are you listening to me? That's the kind of relationship the church has with Jesus. I don't do my will. I do, the church doesn't do its will, her will, his will. However you want to look at it, the church does Christ Jesus' will. Are you listening to me? The wife doesn't do her will. She does the will of her husband. Smile, ladies. Smile big. Go ahead, shout. Say, praise God. I'm doing that. Because some of you are looking at me with a, with a, with a, with a sheepish grin. That's one that says, that's not a real sheep a grin. That's not a grin of a, it's a sheepish one. I want you to get excited about the things of God. You, uh, listen, what happens is the elements and the environment and the atmosphere will try to invalidate God's Word, try to make God's Word not applicable, not meaningful. Well, you just don't understand my unique situation. That's nothing other than a demonic influence. God's Word is a lamp unto our feet. It shows us the ways, the paths of life. It results in us having heaven, days of heaven upon the earth if we obey. People stubbornly want to go in their own way. And they have un- upheaval. They have sadness. They have sorrow that they never need to have. They would just obey. So, simply obeying the Word of God. The Holy Ghost is going to show us how to obey the Word. <laughs> And I, if there's anything that's going to stand as a light unto a city, if there's anything that's going to bring an awakening to this nation, is when God's people have a revival of obeying Christ Jesus, a revival of coming into obedience and submission to the Holy Ghost. But when we're not in submission to the Holy Ghost, when we're not in submission to Jesus, there's an outworking, a manifestation in every other dimension of our life, especially in the closest of our relationships. We're going to get things in divine order. It has to begin in your own personal heart. It has to begin an agreement in your home between husband and wife. It has to begin as an agreement in the household between the children and the parents and the parents and the children. Hallelujah. That's revival. It turns the the heart of the father to the son. The heart of the son to the father. That's revival. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, mighty God. You know, I came supercharged tonight with another message. Uh, but I love God's message. I love what it is. I love what it is He's saying. But when you hear Him speak, what He's doing is He's declaring the solution. He's declaring the remedy to your problem. He, he's, he's showing you how to escape from death. He's showing you how to escape from the hell that you're in. He's showing you how to escape from the upheaval you're in. He's showing you how to escape despair. Because I'm going to tell you right now, to continue to walk in the way that you're going, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's not going to be, there's not going to be a relief. There's not going to be a reprieve. It's going to come on you with greater vengeance. Because when you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. God said, I will not be mocked. We put it out into all these various immoral things. But in reality, there's many things 
right here very apparent to us in our day-to-day -day life in very practical application of being a new creation that we forsake and turn away from like love and joy and peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I know of nothing more important to you and me than the message of love. It's by this that all men will know that we are his disciples. It's by this. It was this compassion that moved him to come and seek and save those that were lost. Hallelujah. Jesus came. He came to, to find and reach out to sinners. I mean, you know, listen, you think about, you know, let me read a couple of verses of scripture to you on this. Okay, because, you know, first and foremost, I'm, I'm, <laughs> there, there's only one way to get into this this message of salvation and get in this ministry of Jesus. And that is because you and I are willing to cooperate with God's love. But I want you to look here in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. The scripture says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I want you to look at another verse of scripture. I want to come back to this one. But an, another corollary verse of scripture that is found in Matthew. Um, and, it's, and it's chapter 18. And uh, you're going to have to give me a minute. It's kind, of, it's kind of dark up here. It's really hazy. I'm praying, I'm praying for some supernatural light. Let me get a, let me get a Bible that's got some light on it. That Bible's not working either. <laughs> Matthew chapter 18. And I'll find it here. Verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And it's amazing how the Lord really emphasizes that He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. To come and seek and save that which everybody else would reject. Because... You know, when he says that, especially when you look there in, in Luke and, and, the, and the message that's being spoken in Luke, Zechariah, he doesn't have a right. He's not worthy of salvation. For the Lord Jesus, just to look at him, here he's lived his life so awfully. He's lived his life in such a wrong way. He's done everything that's wrong. He's cheated. He's stolen. He's lived the life of a lie. He's lived the life of the, of the cheater. He's, he's, he's lived the life of the partier. He's lived the life of access. And Jesus looks at him and just in a moment, and just with a simple little phrase, says to him, today salvation has come to your house. Yeah. Yeah. To just look at this man who's totally unworthy, this man who doesn't have any right to expect that he should be accepted by God. Here's Christ Jesus so full of love and so full of a mercy that seems to go way beyond anything that most of God's people are even willing to touch. Though so undeserving. He says today, I mean he's got all these people around him who you could say are far more deserving. It's like he looks at the most radical, undeserving person in the crowd and says today I must go to your house. Because he's going to seek and say that which is lost. He's come looking for sinners. He's come looking for those who've, who, who, who've completely been left out of every good thing, as it were. He's constantly being emphasized with the woman at the well who's married five times and living with a man who's not her husband. It, it's com constantly being emphasized when a centurion comes beseeching him to come and pray for his child, pray for his servant. And then Jesus says, I've not found so great a faith in all Israel. <laughs> he, he, the, the Syrophoenician woman. The list goes on. A compassion, dear people. A mercy that you and I need to begin to participate with. And we can't have it in the church when we don't have it in home. And we certainly can't have it in the world when we don't have it in the church. So many people have been held back from their giftings. They've been held back from the call of greatness in their life simply because they weren't willing to keep their mouths shut. Yeah. 
Simply because they always had to defend themselves. They always had to be those that were, you know, uh, getting back when somebody else had done them wrong instead of blessing them that persecuted them. They're always letting their wrong response to their enemy stop them from moving forward with the Father. They think that somehow that they don't have to obey love thy enemies. Somehow they think that they don't have to obey bless them that persecute you and they can still be right with God. Somehow they don't think that they have to love their neighbor as their self and they can still move on in divine power and authority. Somehow they believe they don't have to love one another even as Christ loved us and they can still flow in the Holy Ghost. And yet it's the chief violation. Ha <laughs> ha. Is by this all men shall know that we are his disciples. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, these things that have stood in the way of your people being able to move forward. No more in Jesus' name. No more in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, that your people won't be <laughs> gagging at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Huh? <laughs> I've seen some of the most honoring and cantankerous people ever in the church. They don't have a TV, they don't go to the movies, and they don't do all these other things, and they're nothing but a bunch of religious, hateful folks. They're miserable. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Huh? They're miserable. They, here, they, they're, here they straining at a gnat, not watching TV and going to the movies, and swallowing a camel because they don't participate in love. They always got a bad thing to say about everything. That is, the most, that is the most reproachful thing that could be in the kingdom of God. It is the most false, it's, a, it's the greatest example of bearing false witness against Christ Jesus when we say that we are His disciples, that we know Him, and yet people come around and they're always hearing our complaint, and they're always hearing us talk bad about somebody and run somebody down and say how somebody did us wrong, how those people aren't right over there. There's no mo moving forward there. There's a sacrifice at your door. Get up and offer it. Get right with God so you can move on. Hallelujah. My goodness, we've got a world around us. God has brought us. It, 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 it just, it's stunning. Uh, it's stunning tonight to drive up to this property and see a abiding place ministry on that side. It's just, it's stunning. It's stunning. It's stunning. You know how many of my enemies try to stop me from getting here? Do you know how many people around me persecuting me try to stop me to getting from here? You know how many situations set up against me to stop me from getting here? If I would have gone ahead and hate my enemies, it would have stopped me from getting here. If I would have responded to those who persecuted me and entered into the fight, it would have stopped me from getting here. If I would have been unwilling to love my neighbor as myself, it would have stopped me from getting here. If it would have been validate me, it would have stopped me, it would have shut me down. Listen to me. God's got advancements for you, but you're going to have to simply obey Him now. You're going to have to stop doing it your way. It is crazy how people will say over and over again, they just want to do the will of the Father. They just want to walk with the Lord Jesus. And they got one scripture after the next, after the next, proving to them that they're not doing either. <laughs> It's time we just simply open up our eyes to the simple things that God says in His Word and be little children in His presence and being willing now to obey Him Amen. and walk in love Amen. as obedient children. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There is a lost and dying world that Father has given us now. He's brought us to this juncture in time at the last moment of this age of grace. And he said, I'm going to give you every bit of resource and every bit of square footage you could possibly need. And I'm going to set you up so you can go and shine as a light to 3.2 million people so they can have an encounter with me. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't encounter the love of God, you've not had an encounter with Jesus. If when people encounter us, they do not encounter a supernatural love supplied by the Holy Ghost, it does not matter. When, there are, when a miracle takes place, it should happen out of compassion and it should be filled with the presence of divine, glorious love and mercy. Oh, God, help us.
I believe God for a revival to move among this great people right here in the abiding place ministry, a committed people that now need to understand how to be resourced and now need to understand how to grow up just a little bit more and simply obey God more accurately than they ever have before. Hallelujah. To follow their leadership because they follow Jesus Christ. To follow their leadership in a husband. To follow their leadership in a parent. To follow their leadership in ministry in the church because they're following Jesus. You can't have it one place and have, not have it another. Huh? And you cannot have it in the closest relationships and then have them in the distant relationships. And the Lord says, how can you say that you love me? Whom you have not seen when you don't love your brother whom you have seen and he's defining the love there when he talks about the love of the brethren he's not talking about love thy neighbor as thyself he's talking about loving one another with the same love that I've loved you with that is a divine love that is a love that comes only by the Holy Spirit because we yield to him through obedience to the word obedience to Christ Jesus. You cannot yield to the Holy Spirit in any other way but obedience to the Word. I found many people that clearly set the definition in context of those who did miracles and cast out devils that Jesus will say, I depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity or you person that walked in disobedience. Huh? But oh, what happens when there is a real church and there is a real ministry and there is a real walk of God where the miracles of Christ Jesus are accompanied by the love of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Where the signs and wonders of Christ Jesus are accompanied by the joy of Christ Jesus. Where the anointing that breaks off every yoke is accompanied by the great manifestation of the person of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dear people, if there's anything you and I need to understand is that If we're going to participate with the Lord and go and seek and save that which is lost, because that's the ministry of Jesus. You want to follow Jesus? Then what's what you're going to do? You're going to go and seek and save that which is lost. You're going to go looking for, you're going to go looking for that person who is lost. The Son of Man comes seeking those who are lost. You're going to go, you're going to go as the sower who sows seeds and you sow it liberally. And what, what seed are you going to sow? No other name given whereby men can be saved but Jesus. No other name given whereby men can be saved but Jesus. All you have to do is call upon the name of Jesus and you will be saved. Just call upon the name of Jesus. There's no other great message to give. There's no, all the rest of the words are a waste of time. I'm the lost. Listen to me. That's where life begins. That's where ears are open. And we so, we so generously, we, we don't just go, oh, you know, I'm just going to go look for the good ground. And when I find some good ground, then I'm going to sparingly sow some seed. That's not the model, going to seek and save that which is lost. The sower went forth to sow. And he threw the seed in every which direction on the stony ground, on the, on the, on the wayside ground, on the thorny ground, and also on the good ground. <laughs> I mean, we're just looking for the Zacchaeus. He's walking in a crowd of people. He's walking in thousands and thousands of people as he walks down the road. And there's one man who stands out of a thousand, the, probably the number one ranked sinner. But you see, there's something on the inside of him. He's not blinded by the God of this world. Yeah. He, the, 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 the message of salvation is not the smell of death to him. He's, he's one of those who's lost, who wants to be found. And I'm telling you, there's thousands and tens of thousands of people like that in the city. Amen. They lost and they want to be found. They don't want religion. Huh? They want reality. Zacchaeus saw reality in Christ Jesus. That's why he had to put his, he had to get up high enough so he could see him. <laughs> you know, had to climb a tree. Zacchaeus, we sang when we were little, was a wee little man. <laughs> yes, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for Jesus he wanted to see. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 I am so blessed. But what's happening and the momentum that's taking place already in the school of evangelism. And, uh, and what we're going to do is by the help and the grace of God, we're together. We're going to reach in to the insight and the wisdom that only the Lord can give. 
And we're going to let the Holy Spirit teach us how to act like and be like Jesus Christ. And it's got to start fundamentally in this place of dedication to participating with His love. It's got to start there, dear people. We're going to see street evangelism go to a whole nother level. We're going to see crusade evangelism in the parks go to a whole nother level. We're going to see uh, evangelism uh, to, the, to the schools go to begin. Because I don't think we're doing that right now. We're going to see evangelism going to juvenile hall begin. Because we, it started and then it got stopped just at the point of reaching the finish line. And there's so many young kids that can be reached. I mean, I look at Gustavo over here, you know. And, and Gustavo, he, he, as long as he's been out of jail since he was 12 years old. And I mean, he found, he, 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 Jesus found him and he responded to Jesus. He heard Jesus was coming and climbed up in the tree, so to speak. And his, and his life has been changed. And there's so many kids in juvenile hall that are 12 years old that could be turned. It can be turned. But the only way you're going to ever have enough motivation and energy to ever get up and do that is you're going to have to be willing to let the Holy Ghost fill you with something called compassion. Yeah. The ministry of Jesus, that which compelled Jesus to move forward. We hear him say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. And so many people just get stop, stuck right there. And they've got all these different fanciful concepts of what it means to be anointed. But you don't hear the next phrase, to preach the gospel to the poor. Hallelujah. A compassion to go and reach those people who nobody else wants. Jesus has made the rejects his elects. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Oh God, let there come a revival. These things will never happen. You'll never have enough motivation. You'll never, never have enough passion. You'll never, never have an interest. Until suddenly you turn your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to get my love life right. I want to get my love life right. I'm numb inside. I'm not responsive to you. My love life needs to be right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm upset. I'm unhappy. You're going to have to do an evaluation and an examination of your life. You're going to have to be willing to look across at your husband, look across at your, at your wife. You're going to have to be looking look across at your parents or look across at your children. You're going to have to make things right. That love of Jesus has got to exist there. Hallelujah. Praise God. That divine order has got to be there. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not a kind of a love that gets all weird and flaky because my three-year-old kid's not going to start running the house. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Huh? It's going to be a love that's in proper and divine order. Are you listening to me? Huh? My 13-year-old isn't going to be promoted now because I love him so much I'm going to do whatever he says. Forget about it. That's completely ludicrous. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a love that is, a, that, is, that is a cooperating with God in the divine order that Father has set up. And that's the most beautiful and most lovely and the most wonderful thing that could possibly ever exist. It's what the world is missing. It's what sh Satan has done everything he can do to shove out. To shove out of the home. To shove out of the workplace. To shove out of the school place. Oh my, come on. By the help and the grace of the living God. We're going to see the school of evangelism take hold of people where they're at right now and train them to do everything that Jesus did in going and seeking and saving that which is lost. Hallelujah. It's going to take us a while to get all of these things up and running. And I want all of you to email me and tell me what you want to be a part of. We sent out a list. We had a kickoff meeting last night. We sent out a list today. We want you to email us and tell us what you want to be a part of. And because, I mean, I, I go through the list right now, but, you know, it, it's so much you may not remember, you know. And the school of missions and understanding the distinction between the school of missions to do missions not only like we're doing uh, up in Oregon and doing right now in Asia and beginning to do more of in the Middle East. Some great things are happening in that dimension. I mean, God's opened doors in Azerbaijan. My heart's set on Georgia and seeing Armenia once again have a move of God to ultimately set up camp to be able to move in one day into Tehran, Iran. The door's going to open. I believe me, it's going to open. Yes. God's going to make a way to where Damascus, Syria, you can openly preach the gospel in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Jesus appears to people right now because there's, Christians are too afraid to go in. One day in Benghazi, Libya. 
One day, and we preparing for it. I'm laying the groundwork for it. I'm sowing into it. I'm saying, oh God, there's nothing that you would ask of me that I'm not willing to obey. There's nothing that, I, that you would say and ask of me that I would somehow devalue. And say it's not meaningful. I say this all the time. I believe that if people, God's people, would take Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 and just, just focus on that and start living that kind of life, revival would sweep the nations of the earth. Change. Fundamental change. Everybody would have to deal with fundamental change. They would have a mirror that would show them whether or not they had been made a new creation. And then if they had been made a new creation, whether or not they were walking in obedience as sons and daughters of the king. Or whether or not they were walking, in other words, in the Spirit. Because as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And I'm telling you, Matthew 5 and 6 and 7 will help you see clearly whether or not you're doing that. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I believe God, for I believe God has brought us here. He's preparing us. I believe that God's people are, are going to be willing in the day of His power, as the psalmist said. I believe God is shaping us. I believe God is breaking us, that He may mold us, that He may make us, that He may feel us. I believe God is taking and perfecting those things that concern us, wrong ideas, wrong situations, wrong concepts. Wrong types of relationships. Wrong ways of living that maybe we've allowed to be conducted within our lives and conversation for many years. Now God's saying it's not going any further. I'm going to purify myself of people. That's what Father says. I'm going to have myself a people. I'm going, Father is going to glorify the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And everybody who's got the passion of the Father's heart to do the will of the Father is going to participate with that. And that's not just glorifying the name of Jesus in song and all it needs to be. That's not just glorifying the name of Jesus by having the testimony of Jesus everywhere you go. Oh, that needs to be. But it's glorifying the name of Jesus in such a way that you're passionate about obeying Him and honoring Him and doing that which is right. Not putting it on somebody else. You doing it. And it's about you and Him. Not about trying to put it on somebody else. It's about you and Him. God will take care of Him and them. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Peter's all upset. Jesus has told him, you're going to the cross and dying. He's like, well, what about John? What's he got to do? Let's hear about him. And he, Jesus said, don't you worry about John. You follow me. Uh, don't you worry about John? Even if he stays alive till I return, don't you worry about him. You follow me and you're going to the cross. I mean, doesn't mean John has to go die on a cross because John wasn't meant to go die on a cross. Father had another life for him. Hallelujah. Come on now. Be too busy living vicariously. Come on. We're too busy worried about everybody else. Come on now, listen to me. It's time you and I get locked in into a secret place along with Him. Uh, behold His face and understand what exists between myself and Jesus, yourself and Jesus. Amen. How, how is it going on between you and the Lord? Amen. Where's the responsiveness of our heart individually? What is it now that you're not willing to do for Him? Huh? What is it? Are you not willing to love your enemy? You're not willing to do that for him? Because you just, oh God, you just don't know about my enemies. You just don't know how bad they treated me. Well, look at the enemies he had. What are you not willing to do for him? Look at what he's done for you. What are you not willing to do for him? Are you not willing to love your neighbor? Are you not willing to recognize that that person who's blowing their horn behind you on I-5 or I-15 and you're not doing anything wrong, you're just trying to go from one point to the next, but it's not according to their likeness, it's not according to their flavor, and they're screaming with their horn and doing the California wave and even got the roll, window rolled down. Ah! Huh? That happens. That's your neighbor. What's your response? Pull over, pull the tool iron out, crack them across, whatever. What's your response? And I put your horn out, start weaving, start running them out. What's your response? 
because I'm telling you, when you respond, there are people, so many people who've never learned how to stop responding to the influences of the God of this world, the spirit of disobedience. It's time you and I only serve one God, the God of glory, Christ Jesus, and only respond to the spirit of obedience and say no more to all this argument, all this painful look. There's people I've seen for years come into churches, more at other churches than here, just a few here. And the, the look on their face is agony and pain and torment and torture. But if you ask them, if you walked up with a camera and asked them if they know Jesus, suddenly they'd start smiling and talk about how they have this wonderful walk with God. Give me a break. you tormented. The Holy Ghost has never tormented nobody. Devil torments. And he cannot influence or in, he cannot inflict his will upon anyone unless they are willing to cooperate. Huh? huh. I watched A. Allen one day and he was casting out devils. On a, I watched him on YouTube. He's casting out devils. And he brought a woman up who was deemed possessed and been released from mental institution. And he says to people, say, look at how oppressed, see how demonized this woman is? And I said, my goodness, that woman looks, that woman looks better than a lot of people in church. I said, if A.A. Allen came around and started using that as a means to help people express to people how demonized she is, well, who was, who's going to be left standing? You know what I'm saying? Are you listening to me? Huh? And immediately, you should, get really, you should get a smile on your face. You should brighten up. Brighten up quickly. Brighten up. But the Lord wants to be our glory. He wants to be our glory. He wants to, he wants to be, he wants to be the countenance upon our face. He wants to be the lifter of our head. He, he wants to give us the oil of joy and the garment of praise. He wants to beautify us with, with salvation. I mean, my goodness. He, he, wants to be, he, wants to, he wants to put upon our head everlasting joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Leak that humble. He wants to cause us to go out of this place with peace and be led forth with joy. And the mountains and the hills break forth into singing before us. I mean, that's now creation's not groaning and travailing. And rejoicing and celebrating. I'm talking about revival. I'm talking about revival in the abiding place of ministry. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm talking about revival in places that have been broken down, things that need to be repaired, things that need to be fixed, wrong attitudes, wrong positions, wrong dispositions, wrong choices. They need to be set right. Uh, okay? I'm talking then about also growth and maturing and willing to participate with God because you're not going to mature unless you participate. You, the joy will not increase in your life unless you give yourself to joy. Love will not increase in, unless, in your life unless you participate with the love of God. Healing, signs and wonders and miracles will not increase in your life unless you participate with healing and signs and wonders and miracles. You will never raise the dead unless you start participating Participating with raising the dead. I, I praise God for Mike Hogan. I think, what, how many, how many, Mike Hogan's like raised, I mean, God's used him to raise something like, huh? David Hogan. He's used him to raise something like, what, six, seven hundred people from the dead? It's just a huge number. Huh? His ministry. Yeah. I mean, it would have never happened unless somebody started participating with raising the dead. And, you know, I've never personally met Dave Hogan, but a close friend of mine has been friends with him for many years. And, and you know, David Hogan sat down and talked to them about the beginnings of that and how challenging it was and the things that they went through. And, <laughs> right? Every dimension of walking with God has a lot of opposition running against it. There's a lot of hindrances there. What are you going to do? Fall down to them? Cave into them? Say, I had a bad experience, so I'm going to change the doctrine of God? I'm not going to do that. I mean, come on, folks. If both eyes were, if both eyes were plucked out, I mean, my goodness, if, if I was deaf in both ears, blind in both eyes, am I going to change the word of God to accommodate my situation? No. I'm not the expression of the Word of God. Huh? My experience is and does not define what is available. Are you listening to me? Yes. I'm going to go with God. I don't care what's happened against me. I'm pressed into what He says is possible for me. Yes. 
I'm going to press in this, to those things that he says he wants me to do. Hallelujah. I was talking to Adam on the phone today, and Adam's like, yeah, we're going to just keep going at this until a paraplegic in a wheelchair gets up and starts moving around. Then, you know, it's going to get some people's attention. Good, good. Do that. And through the process, God will humble you because before there's going to be that kind of honor, there's going to be humility because Father's going to do it right. He's going to have it right in your life. He's not going to let it run awry. Huh? I remember a man of God standing by the water. He'd go down to the water every day to walk upon the water. Praise God he never walked on the water. The guy became so uh, big-headed without walking on the water if he had walked on the water, what would have we created? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Huh? One day he quit trying to walk on the water. After it failed so many times, he became so discouraged and disappointed with himself. You know what I'm saying? Come on, people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, the most important, the most blessed thing that you and I can be doing is something that is so easily available to us right now. Loving on people. Loving on those who love us. Loving our neighbor. Loving our enemy. Huh? I'm going to ask you a question. How much sacrifice did the person that you're holding something against, how much sacrifice do they have to make to you before you're willing to accept their offering? Uh, how long will you hold it over their head? Huh? Huh? Uh, hallelujah. Wives, <laughs> repent. I know they're going to want this in France. <laughs> the French church loves this. Because the women are completely, totally gone, completely nuclear. <laughs> they completely lost all sense of what it means to be submitted to the husband. And, the, and there's total upheaval. They've demasculated the husband. People don't realize these things. They don't realize it. They don't realize this divine order that God's placed between a man and a woman, how beautiful it is and how powerful it is if it's done God's way. How the God took a man who received all of his self-worth and security from his mom and his dad, and he said, you'll leave your mom and dad and go cleave unto your wife. And, while the, and then the wife takes and completely strips him of his authority and power through the effects of humanism and feminism. And that's why the French love it. They love order in the house. We're going to send this to the French. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Whew. I mean, you know, we're, we're getting ready to, to, uh, to launch School of Music as well. And School of Music, in, in our vision for that, we're going we're gonna to see God put together an orchestra and a, and a, and a choir. And it's, it's just going to, I mean, we're going to, we want to be used by the Lord in such a way that we can participate in building another campus for the Holy Ghost right here that will last till Jesus comes, that doesn't belong to man, that's basically fully empowered with the charter in the kingdom of God to be run as a Holy Ghost ministry till Jesus comes. Amen. With the purpose of, of, of evangelism and, and missions and both locally and internationally and raising up worship leaders who've been trained to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not about performance. It's about excellence in the anointing. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's so many things that we want to do. There, there's, so, there's so many people to reach the value of a soul. What's the value of a soul? What is the value of a single soul? What is the value of a seven-year-old who's never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you value your life more important that to yourself than you value that seven-year-old without the love of Jesus, without the compassion that only the Holy Ghost would fill us with? We'll make that mistake and we won't lay down our life. We're not going to be willing to go. But right now, I'm telling you, the harvest is plenteous. And the Lord Jesus is just saying to us, come ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up laborers. And as you and I begin to ask the Lord of the harvest to lay, raise up laborers, he's going to make you and I the answer to our own prayer. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm looking, I'm looking for a day in the near future where there's going to be 
the common places of every university in San Diego is going to have somebody preaching at lunchtime and break time. I'm looking for the day when every elementary school and every junior high school and every high school has at least one visiting Holy Ghost filled person ministering on the campus in their school at least once a month, bringing the power of God, calling the fire of God and the love of God, binding the powers of darkness that would destroy the souls of men, bringing, bringing salt to this region. Listen, we can, we can do everything, but we can start right here. Listen, right now around us, there are so many apartment complexes right around us. We've got to draw lines, concentric lines, and say, look, there's epicenters here right now. Those that are in walking distance to go in various different ways that we're going to train you in the school of evangelism to go. I mean, I tell you, there's too many people right now in pain and pain and hurting. There's too many that are lost and dying that are desperate for an answer that we can bring them and we're going to bring it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. There's a, this property is contiguous with the high school next door. And I'm telling you, what blood would drip from our hands if we were so negligent, so consumed with our own self-interest. You know, we can conceptualize what this means. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? But reality of it is, it's God painting a picture, picture of our lives if it's consumed with self-interest. If we should be so full of self-interest in absence of divine compassion, we won't reach them. We'll be too intimidated. We'll be too afraid. We'll be too distracted. We'll be too busy. We'll have too many other priorities, too many other needs, too many other things that are so important we must get done. There's a revival taking place. I'm telling you, we had a, we're at a crossroads of revival. We're going to start following Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. He's come to seek and save that which is lost. And then when they come in, they're, they're not going to come in into a midst of a people that are just lost and don't know where they're at. They're going to come into a place where they feel the life and the glory and the power of God. And that exists here, praise the Lord. Amen. I, I praise God for that. And, we, and it's going to increase that anointing. It's going to increase. Increase. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I, I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that it is finals week. I know that. And uh, everybody's working really hard and you're busy. I'm so blessed that you're here. I'm so blessed that you're participating with us in the things that God has given us to do here. About nine acres of land, about 80,000 square feet of places to do everything you can imagine in the kingdom of God. And oh my. And only the wisdom, only the insight that the Holy Spirit can bring will ultimately cause us to be successful and do the right things. We know without a doubt that without Jesus we can do nothing. But we also know that if we'll just come and we'll abide as branches in the vine, we'll bring forth fruit. And when you're bringing forth fruit, don't be surprised when God starts pruning you. Hallelujah. Don't be surprised because it's good. You may say, wait a minute, I like that branch. Why is that branch getting cut off? <laughs> so it can bring forth more fruit unto perfection. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your leadership. Satan, you listen to me. I command you in Jesus' name to take your filthy hands and your demonic influence off the relationships and the lives of the people in this place. You cannot mess with them in Jesus' name. You cannot mess with them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I put the red blood of Jesus Christ upon you and I break the power of every power that is unlike God. Hallelujah. 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 I say it again. I put the red blood of Jesus Christ upon you and I break the power of every power that is unlike God. Amen. Hallelujah. Things come in divine order right now. I command it so in Jesus' name. Satan cannot stop it. It comes into everything about your life comes into divine order. In other words, you begin to submit yourself in obedience to the word of God and the ways of God. Right now. Right now. Right now. 
If there's unforgiveness, it gets forgiveness. It gets forgiven. Amen. You know how the Lord forgives? He erases it and doesn't bring it up again. He forgets it and remembers it no more. How are you going to do that? By divine love. That's it. That's the only way that can happen. That's the only way that can happen. That's the only way. Hey, that kind of mercy and that kind of forgiveness comes out of divine love. This revival must take place for the wonderful works of Jesus Christ to be manifested in this place. And you could say, well, pastor, I mean, 90% of the people are there. No, no, no. Father wants 100% of the people there. Hallelujah. And besides that, we just know that you're going to be robbed of good things when bad things are in your life. And so because we love you, we're going to get after it till the right things are there. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Everybody would just stand with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, living God. Now, now, 13 years ago, we set our heart to get this property. 13 years ago. <laughs> Listen. If the vision tarries, don't concern yourself. It's surely come to pass. When it's right. When it's what God's planned. And as, you know, we've recently just prayed to, to see the hindrances that were standing in front of us because we should have been in this building really two months ago, three months ago. Hindrance was in the way, trying to distract, trying to stop us. And you all stood with us in prayer to break through those things. And God gave to us His help and His strength. And here we are today. We're getting ready to move from here over across the parking lot into the other building. And right now in the name of Jesus, every hindrance that is in the way, we command it to get out of the way. Amen. And we thank you, Father, that you make, you make the impossible possible. Amen. We all know and we all agree that we're supposed to be over there. The Lord has made it plain to us. And so that's where we're moving. And, and we're going to be needing a lot of help. And uh, we're going to be needing a lot of prayer. Amen. And we're going to be needing a lot of finances. And I know you need a lot of finances. And so I've got, a, I've got the plan. And I got it right from God. He gave me a plan right out of heaven that where we can come into agreement and everybody's need will be met by one act of agreement. He said that if we give, it will be given to us, shaken down, pressed together and run over. Hallelujah. That's what he said. He said, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. So even those who sow sparingly get to reap. <laughs> Just going to be sparingly. And he said, if you sow generously, you reap generously. So God would cause all grace to abound unto you so that you will have all sufficiency in all things. And in here, and especially in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Lord's talking about the way that we generously and liberally give to the ministry. Now, God has commanded every one of us to give in five areas. You have to ask yourself if you're doing it because he's commanded it. He's commanded us to give to the orphans, to give to the widows, to give to the poor, to give to the local church, and to give to traveling ministry. And the good news is, it, if you're participating with us in this ministry, you're giving in all five areas because the church is giving in all five areas. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. But... The reality of it is, you're going to have to look at the proportion of your giving on that and say, you know what? If I were doing that outside of the context of the local church, well, I know what tithe is for. Tithe belongs to the local church. Biblically, it belongs to the man of God. Abraham gave to Melchizedek. That's what it belongs to. Well, we don't do it that way because you talk about people getting up in arms. My goodness. <laughs> Huh? If the man of God got all the tithe, we'd be in serious trouble, huh? Well, 
we, we just want to do it God's way and the Lord has given us liberty and he's given us grace and we understand what we are allowed to do in obedience to him. But then there are offerings. And it's there in the context of offerings that then you see all this other giving going on. So that's why we encourage you. People, don't make God unethical. Don't make him a liar. He said he was going to cause all grace to abound unto you so that you will have all sufficiency in all things. He said he would multiply it and cause there to be a harvest. So you can count on him to keep his part, to keep his word, to work his miracle. It's a miracle of faith. Every offering is supposed to represent Jesus from the beginning to the end. Your offering is supposed to be represent the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is true. Hallelujah. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Never come before the Lord empty-handed. Always be ready to worship God with the offering. Worship was not defined in the Old Testament based upon singing. It was defined based upon bringing a sacrifice, an offering that represented Jesus. A lamb, a bullock, an oxen, turtle doves, the rest. Huh? A goat, a heifer. And there is other different offerings. That's how worship is defined in the Old Testament. Old Testament. So let's always come to God into God's presence, into the, into the church, into this participation of this glorious thing with an offering in our hand. With that which you're not, you're not, but you don't have to do. You're not, it's not, you're obligated to do it. But you're so filled with faith and with the love of God and with a divine purpose in the kingdom of God that that's why you do it. And you know that it's not a loss, that it's a gain, that it's not, that it's a means by which you're going to ultimately be able to step into a miracle to do everything that God has commanded you to do. <laughs> because he's purposed us to give like this continually, not just one time. <laughs> so if he's purposed us to give like this continually and live like this continually, then he's promised to be the provider of all that we have need of. So that we can, he's provided us with all the ability to do what he's asked. Isn't that amazing? Say, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus has, provided me has provided me with all of the ability, with all of the ability to do everything, to do everything that he's asked. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody say, well, if I give in the offering, I'm going to go without. Oh, you are? That ain't faith. That's not faith. No, if I give with the, uh, in the offering, I'm going to have more. Hallelujah. 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 We're not asking you to do things that we're not a part of. When we, I'm going to tell you, when we, look at our, when we looked at the church budget and we said we make this move, we recognize, well, in making this move, we won't be able to get, based on the budget the way it was, we won't be able to receive the finances that we were receiving, which for us is just paying the bills. But you know what we said? It doesn't matter. You know why? We don't think that way. From a natural point of view, we think that way. I said, uh, here's what I did. We said, sit down with the board and I said, okay, let's do the budget. Now let's put the kingdom first. First, taking care of everything we need for the new property, the new church. Huh? Second thing, we need for the mission, training center. We'll get through the list. Okay, we've taken care of all the kingdom of God. Okay, now, we're, now we prioritize this down. Okay, now you begin to take care of, the, of leadership needs. Go through that list. Amen. But what we discovered is that when we do that, we always see this miracle increase. But in anger, people, want, people want it to happen before they move. They want to be Thomas and get God's results. The Lord says, step out in faith and watch. I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. If you can prove that God does not exist, there's one way to prove that God does not exist. There is. He says, prove me. Prove me. Through giving. Prove me. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says, prove me. 
Prove me with the offering and prove me with the tithes. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven and give to you more than you can contain. Prove me, dear man. Prove me. Well, I stepped out. Amen. It's amazing that the Lord would say that, huh? I've never been, I've never had that attitude. I'm going to prove you, God. I'm prove you. I've never had that. But he's saying, he's giving it, it's like a challenge, you know. He said, I want you to, I want you, I want to show you how honest I am. I want to show you how truthful I am. I want to show you how serious I am. I want to show you how real I am. That's what he's saying. I've always, we've always given and always participated because it's just a love, constrained by love. And that's what we want it for. That's what we want it to be for you. And I know that if there's problems that exist within your relationships, love problems, it's going to hold you back. And that those things have got to be fixed first. So right now, I want everybody in this place to lift your hands towards heaven and surrender to Jesus. And I want you, right now, every person in this place, I want you to make things right in your relationships right now. Right now. I want you to make them right in your relationships right now. Women... I want you to tell the Lord that you're going to honor Him and you're going to trust Him and you're going to put your husband in His hands and you're going to start submitting and obeying, submitting to and obeying your husband. If your husband's wrong, Christ Jesus is straighten him out. You don't need to straighten him out. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Men, you're going to start ruling your house. Amen. Amen. And that could be a synonym for control if you want it to be. Because I don't know about a whole, a whole lot of difference between rule and control. It's just some splitting hair semantics. You get in charge, in other words. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. If I had a rebellious 17-year-old wouldn't come to the meeting, I'd grab a hold of them by the ear and bring them. You listen to me? Somebody said, what am I supposed to do? Drag my kid to church? I don't know what you'd do, but you watch what I do. Huh? You think I'm going to let my kid go to hell without coming up against me? My goodness, I'd sit on them in the meeting. I'd do whatever it took. One of my kids went rebel on me. I'd do whatever it took. It meant move up into the highest mountain, the Himalayas, and be living all alone. But do that. I'd do whatever it takes. Heaven is real to me, and hell is just as real. I don't have no concept sitting by and watching somebody go to hell. No concept of those that I love. Of those that I love. Praise God that God so loved the world because I was in the context of the world. Hallelujah. Praise God that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost because that's me. And there's a lot of people out there that are lost that want to be found. And somebody's going to have to be Someone's going to have to get a hold of the love of God. Someone's going to have to get their love life right. Someone's going to have to be willing to repent and get every part of their love life corrected and under the, under the influence of the Holy Ghost. So we can be sent. We're going to be sent in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. None of my grandkids are going to hell either. And if I'm going to stay around... Long enough to be a great grandpa, which I believe I am, and none of my great grandkids going to hell. Everybody's going to heaven. I can't change anybody's will, but I'm powerfully influenced. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Get close. Get close. Get close. Cling to one another. Get close. Trust one another. Lay down your life for one another.
It's, a, it's days of heaven on the earth. It's glory. It's life abundant. It's joy unspeakable. It's peace that passes understanding. It's every good thing. It's every good thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if your husband's a rebel, come to me. I'll get you a prayer cloth, put it into his pillow, and we'll believe the fire of God burn him all night long until he repents. Amen. Amen. We'll be like, be like Pharaoh, tormented in his dreams. Amen. Hallelujah. Great God. Hallelujah. Well, come worship the Lord with your giving. And then, and then hug everybody. Hug everybody. Touch everybody. Find out how everybody's doing around you. Bless everybody around you. The family. They, part of your family. The part of the family of God. Bless them. Bless them. It's family. Family time. Amen.